The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. It was rough. I was raised by a mentally ill mo mother, and we were isolated on a ranch. And my mother he used to lock me in the closet. Coming up, best-selling author Stormy O'Marty shares her story and how prayer helped her get through the hardest days. It's amazing how when you have Jesus in your heart, you know, the Holy Spirit of God, life comes alive. The power of a praying woman, next on Life Today. Hi, I'm Sheila Walsh. Welcome to Life Today. One of the things that you probably know that's been on my heart so much for the last few weeks and months is this, it's the subject of prayer, of um, I'm, I'm really praying for an outbreak, a revival in our nation and around the world. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought if I could have one person to have on this program and to talk about prayer, it was so clear to me who I would invite. And I'm so grateful that she said yes. Her books have now sold around the world something like 37 million in about 40 languages. Um, you're going to know exactly who I'm talking about. Please welcome Stormy Omarty. It's so great to have oh, you. Oh, Sheila, it's so good to be here and so good to see you again. You too. <laughs> you know, we go back way, 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 way back, back way. to the music days. Yes. You know. mm -hmm. um, right. But it's right. knowing that you were coming in to be a guest I wanted to refresh myself on your story because mm -hmm. I remembered some of it. I just didn't remember how devastating your story was. And I think yes. for people to understand how remarkable God's anointing on your life is now, it might be good to go back mm -hmm. and let people know who maybe don't know yes. what your childhood was like. Right. It was, it was rough. I was raised by a mentally ill mo mother and we were isolated on a ranch in uh, Wyoming and so we were like 20 miles from you know the nearest little town and miles from the nearest neighbor and my mother um, he used to lock me in the closet I think that's just the way she I never was quite sure why I was put there it was not like I did something wrong and and knew I was being punished and she would just put me there and then forget about it I think uh, and because I was afraid to uh, come out. I, I just couldn't let myself out, you know, and, and I could hear her walking up and down the stairs. It was a closet underneath the stairway, you know, and um, and she was verbally and physically um, abusive too, but I think what affected me most was being locked in that closet. That must have been terrifying as a little it girl. It was, because we, we were, you know, where we lived, it was, um, there was no electricity, no plumbing, no nothing. No electricity? No, nothing. Wow. Gas lamp lanterns, you know, wood burnings, you know, pot yeah. bellied stove. Um, but the worst of it was there were rattlesnakes and black widow spiders oh my everywhere. And they would even come into the house. And so I was always afraid that they would come under the closet, you know, because the door, I could see light under there and, 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 you know, they could squeeze under and I was just, so I'd crawl up in the dirty laundry basket that was in there. And that's where I would stay and, and just hope that nothing came crawling up the basket, you know. So it was terrifying. Was your mom's mental illness treated? You know, was she diagnosed? No. Well, she was diagnosed because she went into the hospital um, to have her gallbladder out, and that's when doctors came in. Um, my dad had doctors come in and diagnose it, you know, and and um, she was she was a multiphobic, multi-personality uh, person that just could change in an instant, and she would become violent and scary. She was frightening. She was really frightening. She wasn't like I'm not talking about just normal, normal mental illness. I'm yeah. talking about really violent. You know, oh, so it was it was scary. And so I grew up with such all these fears, you know, and um, I don't think I've really lost my fear of rattlesnakes. And, Me either. I'm yeah, right there with really? you. Okay, yes. good. I'm not so weird. In fact, they said yeah. that there was an outbreak of tarantulas in Dallas. What? And I was like, I'm going back to Scotland. Oh, <laughs> yes. I'm going with you. <laughs> it's too close to Nashville for me. <laughs> so how old were you when you finally got out of that ranch? Uh, about six about six years old by the time I got out. And we moved out mm -hmm. <clears throat> into this little tiny apartment, you know, in town above the barber shop. And um, 
I, so there was no closet to put me in, let me put it mm -hmm. that way. But she's, she never let up being strange and weird and violent. And, and she used to just haul off and slap me across the face mm -hmm. for no reason that I knew of, you know. And it was so, it's so startling when that happens. Oh, it, it's imagine. just, yeah, it, it, it was a long time getting over all this. In fact, I didn't, I mean, when I grew up, then and um, got out of the house, I was still um, de depressed and anxious mm. and fearful. Fear was like my life, you know. Of course. It's just the way I am, fearful of everything. And so it uh, wasn't until I um, like started working in, in Hollywood and doing, you know, dancing and singing and all yeah, of that. Yeah, you were with some really big names, yeah, too. Yeah, they were, they were wonderful, and I really enjoyed that, but I was always afraid that all these yeah. horrible fears and anxieties and phobias were going to come out and show themselves to other people and I was so I did everything I could to cover it up and it wasn't until I received the Lord when I was 28. How did that happen? Um, I well, it was the girl I was singing with her name was Terry and um, she kept talking about the Lord you know and I, th I thought oh that's so nice for you you know what I mean <laughs> I feel so happy for you I and mean, she was really great and I, I loved hearing her talk about it but I thought oh I don't relate to that I'm just I'm such a mess you have no idea how what a mess I am and how many things horrible things I've done and you know I just kept all that secret and so one day uh, I was really depressed I mean so depressed that I I just thought I I've, I've got to end my life because I can't bear this pain anymore it was so painful and um, you know the anxiety and the depression and the you know just the hurt the, the constant hurt that never goes away that you know? weight to yes, carry that weight yeah it's always with you you know and I thought I can't handle it anymore and I can't keep up the front anymore and she says why don't you come with me to meet my pastor and at that point she says what are you? and I'm hesitating going well um, I think why can't I go and I you know and and she said well what have you got to lose and it, it was a quick examination of my life I thought I have nothing to lose because I am just collecting pills that I can just when I'm ready I'm gonna do it yeah and, I saw part of an interview you did where you said it wasn't as easy to get them back then but no. you've been gathering like two from this friend yes, and two, until what, you had enough until I had enough that I knew I could do it you know and um, yeah, you couldn't get them back then. It wasn't like it's in, you know, every corner drugstore or, you know, in yeah. everyone's coffee table there was a pile mm -hmm. of pills like, you know, can be certain places, mm -hmm. you know. And um, and I was frequently in those places, you know, so I, I knew that, they, you know, that, that people could get them, but I couldn't, yeah. you know what I'm saying. And so um, so I went with her to meet um, her pastor, and he, he it was amazing. He told me that God had a way to if I were to receive Jesus as Lord and he told me the story about Jesus and what he had done for me as well as everyone else and if I were to receive him um, he could change me from the inside out he could transform my circumstances and my life and I was fascinated and he gave me three books to read and he says come back next week and tell me what you think and the first book I read was the Gospel of John, just in a little book What a form. great place to start. I know. It's my favorite, <laughs> favorite book now. And it says, I mean, you can live just on, in oh, that book. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I, I read it, and um, I read the other two. One was on the reality of evil, which mm. I, all my occult practices, you know, said didn't you exist. you dabbled in that world. Oh, full force. Yeah, yeah trying, I was trying to find anything that would give me some relief yeah. from the pain I felt inside. And so I tried anything, and um, and the other one was on um, the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And so I read those books, and and the pastor said when I get, went back to see him, he says, "Well, what did you think of the books?" And I said, "I know they're the truth. I just knew it. Wow. I knew it was the truth." And here I was searching for truth, something that would save my life, you know, and I knew it. And so I received the Lord. Um, in his office that day and my life began to change immediately I, I had a sense of something I'd never had a sense of before and that was hope yeah. I had a feeling of hope and and um, oh, I said wow what is that sensation it's like I feel like I have a future you know wow. and so that that's when this whole story began where I began to go to church and read the Bible and and um, and I remember sitting in church, and you know he was always teaching from the Bible. It was so fascinating. And and um, he said, "Okay, now bring your Bibles on Wednesday night." And I'm going, "Oh, you're supposed to read your own Bible? <laughs> I, wow, wow you know, they're really into it." 
you know? They're serious <laughs> so I, about this stuff. Yeah, they're serious. And so I, I went out and got a Bible, and, and this big one that had four translations, so I didn't oh. carry it like this. And so I read it, uh, one translation at a time, <laughs> and I smart. read it, and oh my gosh, my life, it was like all of a sudden those words came alive. You know, it's a, it's amazing how when you have Jesus in your heart, you know, the Holy Spirit of God leading you and speaking to you and teaching you and guiding you and all of that comforting you and all the things that the Holy Spirit does, life comes alive. I mean, you read that word and all of a sudden you can see what it means. And so that was the life-changing transition where it began. I wanted to ask you, when you first gave your life to Christ and everything became real, did you ever wonder, God, where were you when I was five, six years old? Yes, I, yeah, oh, totally. I, 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 in fact, the more I got to know him, the more I, I wondered that and asked him, you know, is it just because no one in my family was born again and, and mm -hmm. so therefore he wasn't there? You know, but um, it's really interesting that you mentioned that not long ago. Um, three people in th two different countries and three different states said to me the same thing, um, that they felt God had told them to tell me that God protected me in that closet, wow. that he allowed me to go there because, you know, only God knows what could have happened with my mother. Uh -huh. She was really, wow. um, she was really crazy. You could have lost your life. Yes, exactly. I mean, I could have gone out and been, you know, bit by three rattlesnakes mm -hmm. and, you know, six black widows and, and, um, and she would not have known. She would have just, wow. she would, she's it's interesting to world. even see God's protection in what seemed yes. like the worst place possible. Yes, and I never, that never entered no, my mind. And then three different people, wow. I think God knew that I, because the first one I went, Oh, that's an interesting concept, you know. And you know, I, I thought, hmm, can't imagine that. But you know, but then when I, you know, traveled to a different country, and there it is in Canada, someone wow. told me the same thing, and then um, the pastor's daughter told me the same thing. That's amazing. So, yeah, isn't it exactly yeah. the same thing? So, if you think of that life of that terrified little girl, then this Hollywood, you know, singer, entertainer, mm -hmm. you give your life to Christ, to today where I mentioned something like, and I'm sure the number's gone up since we started the program, <laughs> 37 oh, in million. The name of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I echo that, Lord. Yes. Um, of your books, I mean, the, was The Power of a Praying Woman the very first one? No, the first one was The Power of a Praying Parent. Oh, wow. Yeah, because what happened was when, um, when I started, you know, started going to church and everything, and I was working in Hollywood at that time, um, doing all the different TV shows and all that. And um, so I met my husband on one of the recording sessions. Oh, yeah, my future husband. Uh, on a recording session, not knowing that's who he was. But, um, and then we met again in church, at the church oh. I, I was going to. He was going to that for the, I think the first time. He was coming from another church and he went there and we saw each other and went, you know, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we married about a year later. We started dating and married about a year later. And we became, um, the church was growing so fast. I mean, it was like 300 people when we started and it was getting by thousand by thousand. Wow. I mean, it was, it ended up being around 10 or 12,000 people. And so it was growing so fast that they asked us to become home group leaders. That's how fast it was growing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they were desperate for Receive help. the Lord. Okay, will you be home yes, group leaders? Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we Amazing. became home group leaders. And so one um, Sunday a month, we led our home groups. You know, a lot of us, a lot of the couples did. And so we'd have people there. And um, Michael would do the uh, worship, of course. Because he's musical. And Michael O'Mardi and his musical. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. like saying God's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's true. He's a really he's amazing. He's brilliant. He is. He really is. And, um, and then he would um, do the teaching, and then I would lead the prayer time. Wow. You know, we didn't, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. We just knew we were staying ahead of, a week ahead from everybody else. That's <laughs> I love all. that. I know. And um, but we were sincere and, and just, uh, we took it really seriously and wanted to do the best we could. But the prayer time was so, I'm telling you, it was so um, 
well, it, people on the first Sunday, instead of we had I left a half hour for prayer, everybody had prayer requests, and, and we ended up going an hour over. And I, wow. I thought, oh my gosh, when this happened every Sunday, there were so many prayer requests, and we prayed for one another, you know. And so I realized that I had to have another prayer meeting uh, uh, in the month just to pray. Wow. So, but everybody attended it. We would go to one in the morning oh praying. My gosh. Oh my gosh, it was the most wonderful thing. I mean, people were into it. They knew the power of prayer. They knew what the word says, you know, and they they had needs. And and then that group came became so big and it was staying so late. I thought, oh, we've got to divide this group up. So I <laughs> we divided it up for people who wanted to just pray about their kids. Another one where we wanted they wanted to pray about their marriages. Mm -hmm. Another one wanted to pray about just their ministries. People were all in ministry. We pray. So we had all these prayer groups and it was and it was it was packed and long and it wow. was it was powerful. We saw answers to prayer that were miraculous. I mean, and 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 in this this prayer group we had for kids, we prayed and and one one Saturday, um, twice a year, we had all the parents bring their kids and we'd pray for all of them, each one individually. Oh, I love that. It was perfect. We did it all day with food and everything. It was <laughs> it was always well attended. And anyway, that's where all my prayer books came from, or those experiences, amazing. seeing how people prayed mm -hmm. and how and the answers to prayer were astounding. Uh, all of us were just blown away. So when, from that, was that when you thought, you know, maybe I need to put some of this down for other people to yes, understand? It was, it was exactly because I thought we've got to get this out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people know that prayer works. We've got to get this out. <laughs> you know, absolutely. <laughs> when you wrote that first book, did you have any sense of what? Of what God was about to do? Uh, no, I'm not not the how wide mm. it would be, widely it would be accepted. But uh, I had um, just a sense of mission about it. I thought I've got to get this to as many parents as I can because we've seen answers to prayer that were just uh, phenomenal. And and how and how to pray? I got to suggest to them how to pray about certain issues and how to just have a um, you know 30 ways to pray for your children. And you might not think about it, you know. Yeah. You might not think about praying that way. So I was willing when we first did it. I would go around to grade schools or any kind of school who would let me do it and let me speak. And I would talk to them, talk to the parents, and they would turn out. I'm telling you, the women of prayer would turn out. Wow. It was really amazing. And they were they so. Um, um, they let me speak at all these different schools, and I was just doing it because I felt mm, and like a mission. I was on a mission. Oh, sure. You know what I mean? So um, that's that's how they started. So Praying Parent came first, and then I thought, well, it's working for our kids. I wonder if it could possibly work for our marriage. Who knows? <laughs> yes, who knows? <laughs> God isn't, can do anything. That's what <laughs> the know? Bible says. Yes, yeah. exactly. So uh, I didn't know when God started speaking to me about how to pray for your, your husband, and he said, "You got to. He's got to stop praying. Change him, Lord. You know, you oh, got to stop praying that. So tempting. Yes, <laughs> yes. And you got. You got to start praying. Change me, Lord. And I was wow. going. Wow, that's actually a revolutionary shift. Yes, it was for me too. Yeah. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, but he's the one that needs changing. <laughs> you know, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> and um, but no, God says I, I, everybody needs to change. Yeah. And if you're willing to change, she said, I can change. I can start with you. I can use you as an instrument of deliverance for him just by praying for him. Because there's a humility in that before the Lord totally, too. Totally, totally. And it, it's, it's so right. Mm -hmm. you know, it's so right. Even though some women said that they threw that book across the room and it hit the wall, went down behind the couch and they said, because they said, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they said about a year later, they went searching for it behind the couch and they said, it works. It does work. Someone actually said that on my social media. I posted really? you were going to be here. And she said, when I got the power of a praying husband, <laughs> my husband with it. <laughs> <laughs> She said, but then six months later, she said she actually threw the book across the room and yes, hit him. Yes, they all said But she oh, said six she months. Him? No, she hit him. <laughs> <laughs> but she That's said six months later, yeah. she got it out and began <clears throat> to pray that prayer, and yes. it's revolutionized her life yeah, and her marriage. It did. It does. It's because it's a place of humility, and you say, yeah. God, use me as your instrument, and, and, and change me. Make me the woman you want me yeah. to be, and the, you know, the wife you want me to wow. be. In. Well, <laughs> I'm going to try and persuade Story to stay so that we can have another program, because there's so much more I want to share also about a new book um, that she has coming out. But one of the great privileges we have here at Life Today is that we get 
to reach out and touch people that we might never meet on this earth, mm -hmm. but we hope by the power of, of the Word of God and the power of love in action that we might get to meet them in eternity. So we have this great project coming up for Christmas, and I want you to be part of it. So would you take a look at this? Mountain villages like this in Southeast Asia are home to many poverty-stricken families who struggle with the usual obstacles of life. And it is here that the ministry partners of Life Outreach are able to help some of these families who face a unique challenge. This is Suanine. He was born with a cleft lip and cleft palate. He struggles just to swallow milk, and oftentimes his lungs will fill with fluid, putting him in grave danger. But Suanine's life would soon change. After learning of his condition, Life's mission partners moved into action. These dedicated missionaries arranged for the long drive into the city and provided the corrective surgery that could save Suanine's life. You know, we were able to say yes to that distraught mother and help Suanine only because of the Life Outreach family. It was Life Outreach's prayer and financial support that saved that little boy. So in Ayn's disfigurement became a beautiful smile, matched only by the smile of his loving mother. With tears in her eyes, she says, thank you for helping my son. A big thank you to the Life Outreach family and to you, Sheila. It's a privilege to serve with you as we share the gospel of Christ and as we provide life-changing cleft palate surgeries in our part of the world. So I have a thought. How about we reclaim Christmas? Do you remember what it's actually about? It's about when we were lost and broken and helpless and hopeless. God came in human flesh. God with a shoe size. Can you imagine that? To save us. And now Christmas had become this overindulgent, all about me, you know, how much money can I spend? How much debt can I get into? We as the body of Christ on this planet, wouldn't it be great if we just started to live so differently that people wanted to know, as it says in 1 Peter, a reason for the hope that is in us. So I'm just, my, that's what my husband and Barry and I and our son Christian want to do this Christmas. Instead of getting a lot of gifts that none of us really need, we want to be able to provide um, a surgery for one of these children. Now the amazing thing is that the doctors we work with, they're so sacrificial, they love the Lord. They have worship services before they get into surgery. And for $500, we can um, provide a surgery like that. Because what you might not know, when a child is born with cleft lip and cleft palate in so many of these countries, there's a lot of superstition and misunderstanding. And that child is often seen as somebody who's cursed and they won't let their other children be around them. They don't want that child in school. Let's let these children and these moms know, no, your, your life is not cursed. There's a God in heaven and he heard your prayer and he sent us to be the answer. So if you're able to do that, that would be fantastic. But this is also the very last week of our shoes, um, Christmas shoes. The number of children around the world who don't have one single pair of shoes. And because of that, because they walk around on rough ground and they get cuts and infections, it can literally take the life of a child. But do you know that these amazing little shoes, we get these made for like $3.60. So what we wanna do for Christmas is make sure that 150,000 children get their very first pair of shoes. Now we can do it together for $36, you can provide shoes for 10. For $72, 20 children get shoes, $180. I mean, you spend that nowadays, big family going to a movie and then going out for dinner. 50 children would get shoes. Now we have this also amazing thing at the moment. We have these little Christmas shoes that for any gift at all, you can hang that on your Christmas tree and it will remind you that God came in human shoes to save us. And now we have the privilege of reaching out in his name. Now it's a lot, 150,000 children. Um, it's a lot with the cleft lip and cleft palate surgery. So that's why if we do it together, let's make this the Christmas that we decided as God's people to reclaim Christmas and to make it about giving. Would you call that number on your screen? 
Just give the best gift you can. That's all we're asking. But do it in Jesus' name with a glad heart. Poverty is a killer. And because of it, children needlessly suffer, not only from a lack of food and clean water, but also from a lack of things we often take for granted, like a simple pair of shoes. Far too many children living in extreme poverty have never owned a new pair of shoes. And while that may seem minor in light of all their needs, walking with bare feet puts them at risk of life-threatening infections and disease that could lead to crippling consequences and even death. By responding today, you can help immediately secure and begin shipping Christmas shoes to 150,000 children around the world, just in time for the holidays. Your gift of $36 will help provide 10 pairs of shoes, a gift of $72 will provide 20 pair, and a gift of $180 will help provide 50 pairs of Christmas shoes for children in need. As a thank you for your gift of support, be sure to request this beautifully crafted green crystal shoe ornament, a treasure to display at each Christmas. With your gift of $100 or more, you may also request this keepsake boxed set of life's Christmas shoe ornaments. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,000 or more to help provide over 275 pairs of shoes or two children with corrective cleft palate surgeries. And you may request the beautiful Safe in the Shepherd's Arms bronze sculpture. This is the last week. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. Thank you so much. The lines are busy. Keep calling. And for any gift at all, too, we want to send you the power of a praying woman. Over two million sold. It's probably more than that, isn't it now? It is, yeah. It's, it, it is. I don't know what the total is right now, wow. but that was, this has been out a, a, couple, you know, a few years. So. Wow. So. Well, just on behalf of... All the women watching around the world, this show goes in Australia and South Africa and all oh, sorts of different great. countries. I just want to say thank you. Thank oh. you for being obedient oh. to the call of God on your life, Stormy. It's changed us all. Oh, well, praise God. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And it's changed me, too. Just yeah. uh, hearing from the other people all over yeah. the world has just been so touching. Yeah. Well, I think she's going to stay on. So we'll see you next time <laughs> on Life Today. I'm Sheila Walsh. See you next time. If you are in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, come be a part of the Life Today studio audience. Go to lifetoday.org forward slash tickets, lifetoday.org forward slash tickets. In 1996, Alice received a mandatory sentence of life in prison. In 2018, President Trump commuted her sentence, her journey tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.